Thank you very much. Um, it's really my honor to be able to uh, come to this conference to share some of my uh, uh, theoretical thinking about the, uh, comparing the authoritarianism between CCP and KMT across the street. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, how I think CCP and KMT are different kinds, different types of authoritarianism. And thus, I uh, believe they will have different paths of uh, uh, regime transition or regime uh, change. Uh, because I say this because against the background uh, of literatures uh, that emphasizing uh, that how CCP and KMT are similar in terms of being uh, party state uh, uh, or other kinds of similar types of authoritarian regime. Uh, so uh, that is the reason why I, th I think it's pretty misleading if, if we believe in that. Uh, because if we believe that they are the same type of authoritarianism, we would, uh, it's more likely for us to expect that CCP will go through the same process of democratic, democratic transition as KMT did in Taiwan. So I want to go to the very root of this causal mechanism uh, that I believe they belong, belong to different types of authoritarianism. So this is the, uh, and, and I use two theories. One is uh, the post-totalitarianism, another is competitive authoritarianism. And then, I'll, then I will compare KMT uh, with CCP. I think it will be easy if you can see what you look at this part one. Okay. Um, so first of all, let me begin with uh, briefly reviewing uh, some of these literatures that, uh, not that I totally uh, disagree with, <coughs> but I think they have not made clear enough uh, 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 the, the typology of these two kinds of uh, alternative regime. First of all, Zheng uh, Geren, T.J. Zheng, uh, his work in 1989 emphasized that KMT is a quasi-Leninist regime. <clears throat> I think he was right, but he was not clear enough. Because in his article, he also emphasized that he said quasi because KMT uh, had this local election and thus made it a little, a little bit different from the Leninist regime, so the quasi-Leninist regime. But still, people took it as part of Leninist regime. I think that's not clear enough. And then Steve Zeng, Zeng Ruisheng, a good friend of many of us, <coughs> he was more explicit in emphasizing that the Leninist uh, feature was merely a part of KMT's nature. Uh, he emphasized that KMT had this anti-communism ideology, which made it different from a Leninist uh, feature. But again, you put it into the Leninist category. This is not clear enough. We should put it into the other category. You know, when you emphasize they are below to the same category, you are emphasizing their similarity, not their differences. So theoretically, that, that's not clear enough, I think. And Bruce Dixon, again, same thing. He emphasized uh, KMT and CCP as two Leninist parties, not regime, parties. Uh, this is a different unit of analysis. <clears throat> it's a very smart strategy, analytically, but it's not uh, uh, clear uh, logically. Because he emphasized that these two Leninist party uh, have different degrees of adaptability. OK, that's good enough. But why? <laughs> why do they have different degree of adaptability? When you put them into the same category, you cannot explain the difference. So I think they, they, they all commit to the same mistake. Not mistake, but uh, they're not clear enough, I think. Uh, and again, Edward Friedman and Joseph Wong, again, the friends of uh, many of us, they have edited a book in 2008 emphasizing the one-party system. I remember <coughs> the, the subtitle of that book was uh, Learning to Lose. Learning to Lose. 
Okay. But again, in this book, they put KMT, PRI in New Mexico, and China under the same category. I think they're more different than they're similar. Uh, I, I think that category is, uh, is effective in comparing their similarity, but, but this, this category is too wide, I think. Wide enough that I have, we have to emphasize their differences. So that is the background of this comparative uh, politics literature. And I think there are some certain points about CCP as a regime that we're not clear enough. And, and before I go ahead, let me emphasize <coughs> what Lit emphasized about the difference between post-totalitarianism and, uh, and the other kinds of regular authoritarianism. He said it would be misleading to consider post-totalitarian authoritarian regimes as having the same characteristics as those that never conceived by their founders to become totalitarian or that never went beyond a defective totalitarian stage despite the efforts of some of their founders. And continued, he said, the totalitarian phase has left many structures that can be transformed but are unlikely to disappear and has created an image of a type of polity to which some of the elites still feel attached. Think about what Xi Jinping is talking about right now. <laughs> this is exactly the, the example. I think Li has foresaw that years before before, and whose positive aspect, so to speak, they might wish to retain or attain. Look at what Xi Jinping has emphasized about the, 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 the mass line. Okay, so <coughs> the post totalitarian regime of the theory emphasized several things. First of all, a limited political pluralism. This limited pl political pluralism is different from, other, from, from, from the one of other authoritarian regimes in several things. First of all, uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's the pluralism within the, the ruling bloc, within the bureaucracy, not rooted from the social interest. Uh, second, the, the pre-existing social interest structures were basically, basically eliminated by the totalitarian phase. So this is very different from for example, authoritarian in, 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 in uh, 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 Latin American countries or in some European countries, the pre-existing the pre-existing social interest or social institutions like churches still exist, and they exerted a lot of influence during the, the period of, uh, of authoritarianism, and, he, and eventually, sometimes some of them contributed to the process of democratization. And in the post-authoritarian a regime, those pre-existing social interests were eliminated already, or, or absorbed into the state, party state. So this is totally different. We're not saying that under the post totalitarian regime, there's no plural social interests, but they're new. They're newly emerged social interests, which means they don't have strong social base, not to speak political base. So this is a very important difference. So this, the plural social interests, so to speak, plural social interests under post-totalitarian regime, they're rooted in the division within the ruling bloc or within the bureaucracy. Okay, so this is a big difference. The second is ideology. First of all, for, for those who had a totalitarian past, their, their ideology, the party, or the party cadres, or party members, they are vanguard elite by definition, by nature. Uh, they're su they are superior political class with monopolistic power, self-justified. <clears throat> um, of course, we understand when the totalitarianism went through a process of routinization, um, uh, usually the ideology became a, a living lie uh, for ordinary people. Um, so it has lost the effect of binding all the society together. However, it's still very important for the regime itself to justify its own monopolistic power or legitimacy. There's a positive as well as a negative side of that. Because in comparison with other authoritarianism, other authoritarians, they don't have ideology. So their legitimacy is always transitory or short-lived. I mean, they only have today 
that will be for tomorrow. But for a post totalitarian authoritarianism, they have a future. <laughs> no matter they believe it or not, they have a utopia. And they justify their legitimacy based on that. Despite the fact that most people don't believe it, they may not believe it either, but they have to believe it. Because they enjoy a monopolist power that cannot be justified otherwise. This is very important. Uh, uh, for other authoritarianism, they don't have that. It sounds like a positive thing, but at the same time, another, at another uh, side of the coin, it's also a negative thing, because you always have this gap between the utopia and the fact. That's always the crisis, uh, origin of the crisis of legitimacy. So it's a permanent crisis of legitimacy for post-totalitarianism. And third, uh, aspect of post totalitarianism is mobilization. Uh, like CCP, they have a wide, wide range of uh, auxiliary organizations they call mass organizations, such as All China Federation of Trade Union, or, or Communist Youth League, or uh, Women's Federation, things like that. As uh, Dick Schiffel emphasized, well, most of these uh, organizations they went through a process of atrophy or function. They became uh, bureaucratized. However, when necessary, when facing crisis, the regime can always reignite uh, or, or restart the machine and penetrate into the, into the society. Look at the, uh, the case of SARS. I mean, the regime was really powerful in terms of regulating uh, grassroots community. I mean, Taipei, we have also the same crisis, and some of the patients, uh, no one can regulate them because we don't have that kind of penetration into the very, very grassroots of society by the state. But it's quite different in mainland China. Quite different. Um, and nowadays, uh, some of the uh, uh, cities or provinces, the state and the party is trying to re uh, to give a new life to this uh, 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 organization. They, they call it a pivot type organizations. They want to regain the leadership and the penetration for this mass organization, uh, re rebuild a, re a leadership relationship between this mass organization and the regular grassroots NGOs. So this is something I found in Guangdong, but I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on that. And another theory is competitive authoritarianism. Uh, uh, as many of us know that uh, uh, Gilles, uh, the Hedonist uh, Toriel, Lovitsky in the way, or Schettler, they all have, or Gamian and uh, they have all emphasized um, the fact that in the competitive authoritarianism, which means that authoritarianism runs to some extent meaningful elections, in authoritarianism like this, uh, parliament and political parties are important political institutions that the ruling elite can build a coalition for consolidating and stabilizing their uh, legitimacy. <clears throat> Let's take a look at this. I'm sorry, I don't have an English version. The original was English. But let me explain. <laughs> original was English. This is one party rule. This is democracy. And this is the probability of transition. These are other authoritarianism. This is military. This is one party dominant, multi-party authoritarianism. This is pure multi-party authoritarianism, which is more competitive. Okay? And take a look at this. The probability from one party rule to democratization is only one fifth. Most of the time, the one party authoritarianism became other types of authoritarianism. This is very clear. This is very clear. So, uh, and where does the KMT stand? KMT stand here before democratization. So again, there are different types. KMT was a competitive authoritarianism. In short, NCCP is not. As simple as that. Okay. So let me compare some aspects of KMT and CCP. First of all, party and the state. As we all know, I'm not going to talk about nomenclature, Shall know has as I said already, but another very important mechanism for the party to control the state is the, so to speak, leading party members group, or Dangzhu. This is a party group 
within every individual state organ. And that is the real leadership core uh, of that state program. For example, if you have a ministry, you know, uh, for example, Minister of uh, Science and Technology, uh, he is actually uh, not a CCP member. He is a Democratic, so a Democratic Party member. But actually, he is not a real leader. The real leader is the party small group. And there's a party secretary of that party small group which is not the minister. Okay, he is the real boss. So that is why that, that's very important. And let's take a look at the KMT. KMT also, under Chuck Hasek, also intended to establish that. Okay? Before it moved to Taiwan, during the anti-Japanese war, 1941, already Chuck Hasek has said that party branches should be universally established within the all levels of all levels of governmental organs. Okay, and then in 1950s, when China Shen was defeated to Taiwan, he tried to reconstruct the party because he learned the lesson. You know who, from whom he learned the lesson from? He learned the lesson from CCP. He wanted to have the same organization as CCP. So he said, let's build that, setting up party branches in the central, the, at the central level, all this executive, examination, and judicial gun. And then within the legislative gun, he established the party cards, the same thing. And there was a party coordination committee to coordinate the, the disparity among this Yeah. So it seems that he had this same organization, right? But at the local level, the story is more interesting. Let me put it very short. Let's go down to the very lower, lowest level, that is township level. There was something called 41 mechanism. 41. The one is, is called the General Political Small Group. The General Political Small Group has a party secretary of that, right? But under that, there's the party committee. The party committee is part of that, not itself, okay? Party committee and the government and the farmers association and public private school. Because the public private school has the widest penetration into the community. So four of these things form a group led by this general political small group. And guess what? Sounds very powerful, right? Nah, it's not working. Why? You know why? Because the election. Because this guy does not have the power of nomination of the candidates. It doesn't work. Because this mechanism is a bridge between the Melander group, a uh, Melander regime, which is actually to Taiwanese society, it's an alien regime. It came from mainland China. And you have a bunch of local Taiwanese politicians in the bridge. This local party coordination mechanism is a bridge. But when it's bridged, it has two sides, you know? And at this side, telling you sides, is coordinated by election, not by party. The party can only nominate, but you have to nominate who can get elected. Right? So it cannot, when you have this another large political logic, it cannot be monopolized by the party state logic. Here's the thing. You know, so an electoral authoritarianism, a competitive authoritarianism, undermines the logic of party state. That's very simple. Okay, that's the logic. And the social group, almost the same thing. They want to penetrate, but the social group, when during the 70s and the 80s, when there were widespread social movements and new social groups emerged from this kind of social group, uh, social movements. You know what? These social movement organizations, they went hand in hand with what, you know? With election, with political opposition, emerged from this election. So, because of time, let me go to media, I'm not gonna emphasize that, and uh, election, I said that already. Okay, let's go to the conclusion. This is the conclusion, very clear. First of 
all, when we say party state in democratization, there's a question mark. Because some of the party state went through democratization, some didn't. Right? What's the explanation? Party state cannot give us explanation. We need our theories. So here are the two theories. post authoritarianism and competitive authoritarianism. There's an affinity between them. And the case of KMT gave you a very explicit example how that logic works. In short, a, a post-authoritarianism does not prefer a competitive authority. It doesn't like political election. All the elections in mainland China, they only support, support party state logic, not undermine. And party works very hard to make sure of that. Okay? Uh, whereas in, in Taiwan, the competitive logic of that authority undermines not only, well, first of all, the KT was not opposed to the terrorists, right? So it undermines the, the logic of par party state. And also, I have to emphasize in Taiwan, KMT was alien regime. Alien regime also undermines, it needs the competition. It needs the election. An alien regime needs the election to connect the regime with the local society. To co-opt the local political elite into the political process. So that they become a supportive pillar for the legitimacy of authoritarianism. So the competition itself serves as a role for supporting authoritarianism, but eventually it undermines it. Okay, so there, that's the reason why eventually that process contributed to democratization. But for CCP, it's only here. You don't have this and you don't have that. So it's a post totalitarian party state. So my prediction is that we won't go through the same path of regime transition as KMT did. If eventually there is a democracy in China, it must go through some other path. Okay, that's my presentation. Thank you.